The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We have a very diverse show, starting out with public bathrooms in New York City and the need for more. We have somebody coming on to talk about uh, legislation, hopefully giving more of us a chance to be able to use public bathrooms. Next up, we talk about subways and the access from or by the disabled uh, to be able to access the subways through either elevators or ramps. And finally, speed cameras. You ever get caught by a speed camera? Well, you better be careful because they're going to be 24 hours at certain times. Stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more coming up right now. Welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. Um, as old as I am, anytime I get a social influencer on the show, I get all giddy and excited. Uh, and today we have with us Theodore Siegel, um, also known as Teddy. I can call you Teddy, am I correct? Yeah, yeah Teddy's perfect. All right, and we're gonna be talking about bathrooms in New York City and the need for more public bathrooms, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Before we do that, let's get the viewers to know a little bit about you. I know you have a very big following on TikTok, but tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, I'm currently living in New York City where I attend graduate school for opera. I go to Manus School of Music and I graduated from UCLA last year with a Bachelor of Music in opera as well. And what made you decide to use social media as a mechanism to get your word out, should we say? Well, I've always had an extremely small bladder, so going into New York City ever since I've been little has been extremely anxiety inducing for me. And so I basically just created a resource that I thought was something I would want and that I would assume others would find useful as well, because everyone's got to go. So. So in the past, when I've gotten had to go, I generally put on a nice face, knock on a restaurant's window, and I ask politely, can I use your bathroom? Sometimes I'll even end up, you know, getting a Diet Coke at the bar or something just so I don't feel like I'm just using their facilities. What do most people do when they have to go? I mean, is there a particular, assuming there's no public bathrooms, what, what do you do? <laughs> well, I usually look out for department stores. They usually have public bathrooms as well as churches. Churches, I feel like most people don't realize that they have bathrooms that they'll let the public use. But like you were saying with being able to walk into a restaurant, I've learned through speaking with my followers that not everyone has the certain privilege that I have being a white woman. I can walk into most establishments and be able to discreetly use the bathroom without being questioned or just told to leave. And I've learned through speaking with my followers that unfortunately marginalized groups are bearing the brunt of New York City's failures when it comes to the lack of public, sanitary and accessible bathrooms. Oh. And so what do you propose? What, what well, are your, how do we fix this, this issue? Well, I think that council member Rita Joseph and Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine are definitely on the right track with intro 28, which this legislation will require the city to identify locations in every zip code where there are bathrooms, but they're not building more bathrooms. That's not what this bill is doing. So I think that this is one baby step in the right direction so how does that work? So let's say I'm in Queens. I, I was born and bred in Queens. I happen to know it well. And I'm back in the borough and I have to use the bathroom. Am I going to know from an app or someplace where I'm allowed to go without having to beg? Is that how it works? I don't believe it's going to be an app, but there's going to be some sort of like data resource where they they will show where the bathrooms are particular bathrooms that we can use if we need to go. Correct? Yes, it's going to be at least one. So hopefully more than one, but at least one in every zip code. I would hope at some point it's more than one because Queens is very big. As yeah. Is where I work or Brooklyn and which is the Manhattan. Mm -hmm. is there, has there been a push, you know, through Mark Levine or Council Member Rita Joseph to 
expand from one to two to 20 to 30. It'd be nice to have multiple bathrooms that somebody could use or, you know, that's, you know, marked or, you know, purposely saying you can go here. Does it look like yeah. that will happen? I hope so. I can't speak on their behalf, but I hope that that will happen. And I know that they were speaking about the fact that there are currently 15 fully functioning self sanitizing bathrooms just sitting in a warehouse in Queens, and they can't do anything about it until the city council allows them to move forward. So I know, I think you just had a rally. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we did last Tuesday. Well, tell me where the rally was and how many people were there, if you could. Yeah, the rally was on the steps of City Hall in downtown Manhattan, and there was a, a pretty good turnout. Um, so yeah, it was super exciting. It was really great to be able to put my voice out there, not only to speak on my beliefs, but as a representative of my got to go community. So that was really awesome. What did your, what did your followers think? Did you get some positive feedback? Yeah, they loved it. I post a clip of my speech on my TikTok, and it has over 600,000 views now, and everyone really liked it. I what's, hope. Next, what's next for you? What's your next mission? I mean, it can't always be bathrooms. What else is there that I know that you were excited that you were in the New York Times? I saw a little bit of that. Um, sure. What's next for, uh, for Teddy Siegel? Well, right. Well, my account started with just sharing bathroom locations and sharing codes, but I'm really focused right now on sharing stories. And I created a blog, which I have linked in the bios of both my TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter as well, where I share stories of New Yorkers and tourists alike who have had hardships due to the lack of sanitary accessible and public bathrooms in New York City. And I hope that through sharing these stories, more change will be enacted. Um, what about the disabled? I, I, you know, we, we've had other um, guests on the show earlier today discussing accessibility uh, mm -hmm. you know, to the subway system for those who are disabled, ramps, elevators. Well, bathrooms too are hard for the disabled. Are, can these bathrooms be um, you know, configured in such a way that the disabled can use them as well? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that it's definitely a priority and it should be a priority. I've heard from followers who are disabled themselves or who have friends who are disabled, who have shared stories about friends not being able to make it to a bathroom in time that was wheelchair accessible. And it really is just, that's just a violation of human rights. That I, know, I, have to, I have to ask this. I don't know if you can answer me, but I have to ask this. Um, any thoughts on running for any kind of seat or any kind of office someplace? You have a platform. Uh, you have a lot of people who, who follow you. Uh, is public service something that you want to do? It's definitely something I'm passionate about, but my priority right now is finishing graduate school. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. All right. Well, it's a pleasure having you on. Hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of your TikTok influencers will take a look at our show also. I know my 11 year old son's excited just to meet you um, through uh, through the show. So hopefully you can come back the next couple of weeks, a month or two, and let us know how you're faring with the uh, bathroom issue. OK. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, our pleasure. All right. Stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more right after this. Back to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We're going to be talking about subways, uh, specifically elevators, ramps, and access 
for those who are disabled. We have with us today a uh, disability rights advocate attorney, Emily Seelingfreud. Emily, thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you for having me, David. All right, let's work. Uh, let's work backwards. Um, what is the current state of the subway system throughout New York City with respect to access for the disabled? Good, bad, somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, I think all that you have to do is go into the subway and you uh, get a sense that it's pretty much off limits uh, for the vast majority of folks with disabilities. 25% um, of stations have elevators or ramps, which means essentially three quarters of the city is off limits to the over half a million New Yorkers uh, who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices to get around. Now, is that a logistical type of uh, issue? In other words, these particular stations can't be built or re reconfigured so that we have elevators there or we have ramps there. Why 75% do not have them? What's the reasoning? Uh, so, you know, the New York City subway is one of the oldest in the nation and in the world. It was built in 1904, um, obviously at a time in which people with disabilities did not enjoy the rights that we enjoy today. Um, and so there are logistical challenges. Obviously, there are platforms where it's difficult to put an elevator in, but uh, it's possible in all of these stations or nearly all of these stations. And so it's just a matter of, um, you know, people with disabilities kind of uh, fighting for their rights and basically saying, you know, we want to access this um, major way that New Yorkers get around um, as well. Are the disabled um, affected in particular areas in the city? Are there those, you'd say, where my office is in the South Bronx or maybe uh, areas in Brooklyn that are more prone to lack of resources for the disabled? Uh, so this affects all of New York. Um, there are, you know, lines and neighborhoods across the city that are off limits um, for everyone. And that's in all five or in all four boroughs. Our lawsuit does not cover the Staten Island Railroad, which is a separate system. But I will say that um, the number of inaccessible um, areas of the city is disproportionately um, in outside of Manhattan. So in all of the other boroughs. So right. this lawsuit will, you know, achieve access for uh, lots of New Yorkers. Okay, so now that we know what's going on, let's talk about the lawsuit itself. Um, how is it filed and who filed? Uh, so Disability Rights Advocates, uh, the law firm that I work for, we're a nonprofit. We represent six uh, disability rights organizations and four individual plaintiffs um, who use wheelchairs. And we filed this lawsuit in 2017, um, seeking access to the subway system under the New York City Human Rights Law, which guarantees equal rights um, on equal terms and conditions. And we also simultaneously, or a few months later, filed a lawsuit basically challenging the MTA's practice of renovating stations without including accessibility upgrades. And was this filed in state Supreme Court in, in Manhattan? Was it filed in federal court? Where was it filed? Uh, so th this settlement uh, settles two lawsuits. Um, so the lawsuit about full access to the system was in state Supreme Court, and the lawsuit about how the MTA um, unlawfully renovates stations was filed in uh, federal court. Federal court. So it actually had both jurisdictions. Um, are you happy with the settlement? I know settlements are always a little bit iffy because you know no neither side is ever really particularly happy. That's how you know you have a good settlement. Um, <laughs> tell me, give me some numbers and tell me what your thoughts are. I can tell you're a lawyer. That's a, a lawyer's uh, remark. Um, you know, I think we're thrilled with this commitment from the MTA. Um, this is a pretty unprecedented pace of access. Over the last 40 years, the MTA has only made 25% of the system accessible. Um, so to commit to by 2055, making the remaining 75% accessible um, is a pretty unprecedented rate of access. And I think it's important to think about kind of all of the New Yorkers whose lives are going to be changed by this decision. Um, the inaccessibility of the subway impacts where you live, where you work, um, you know, who you can meet for drinks after um, after the day at the office, all of these things. And as a New Yorker who uses a wheelchair myself, um, I really understand the impact of that. And so each elevator at each new station, it really is a win impacting well, thousands of people. What would you do, Emily, in those situations when you would reach a particular subway station and, and you couldn't access it through your wheelchair? How would you in the past or now, what do you? What would you do? Uh, so you know, I think every New Yorker who uses a wheelchair kind of has a mental map of kind of the city in their head, and they kind of know which neighborhoods are off limits to them. And so it really does just impact where you go. Um, you know, you're not going to suggest going to this restaurant with a friend because you know it's not near an accessible subway station. Um, Damages again. And I understand that now they're going to be forced to renovate or to um, 
reconfigure, but financial damages, uh, was that included in the settlement at all? Any money being paid here to the, uh, to the uh, um, named plaintiffs, the class action? Uh, so I really can't uh, shower enough praise on our plaintiffs enough. Uh, they're all civil rights heroes who kind of have shepherded this issue in the courts and out of the courts, and they filed this lawsuit just seeking inductive relief, just seeking change. Um, so no money is. Do you think by doing that, it made it a little bit easier for the court to push these changes through as opposed to financial, or did it not really matter? Um, you know, I just think everyone recognizes um, this is the right thing to do. Um, this is a civil rights issue. And I think kind of the fact that our clients are so self-sacrificing and so narrowly focused on accessibility uh, really just sealed that point home. So what's next for your organization? What else are you working on for the disabled that you think you, our viewers would want to know? Uh, so, you know, we are still, so we've thankfully settled this lawsuit and we're thrilled with the result. I will say we are still... Um, challenging the NTA in court about their failure to maintain the elevators that do exist. So, you know, even if a station does have elevators, you could get to that station that's off limits for you because the MTA isn't maintaining them. So we are still litigating that case, although we do think there's room for settlement there. Um, but we're going to keep fighting for the subway to be truly accessible on all fronts for New Yorkers. And I've spent a lot of time on the subways uh, in while well, I've been living in New York City, and there has been an uptick in crime. Um, do you find that the disabled are more um, vulnerable now from what you're hearing? Are they easier targets? Um, and will changing the subway stations and the accessibility help or, or harm? What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I think getting a lot, frankly, the issue right now is that all the folks with disabilities don't use the system. Um, they're just intimidated by it. They're intimidated by a system that really doesn't work for them. And when they do use it, they may well be trapped in that system um, if they cannot um, you know, get to certain areas of the city. So I think basically allowing them to use the system on equal terms with everyone else is nothing but a good thing. All right, well, I wanna thank you, Emily, for being here. You're doing some very, very good work. It was a major win for you. Um, and cause I, I do look around the subways when I'm there every once in a while and I see elevators out of service um, or, or ramps that aren't even aren't there. Uh, you, you just notice it. Uh, and sometimes people have to help pick up somebody with a wheelchair and pick them up into the, uh, on the stairs. It's really just not fair uh, to, those, to those who are disabled and really never been. So you do some wonderful work here and we wanna thank you uh, at, at today's verdict. Um, hopefully you'll come back the next couple of months and let me know what else you're working on. Uh, thank you so much, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. All right, stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more right after this. Welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We're going to be talking about speed chat cameras today. Two guests who are here. We have Sean Garcia from TA's Bronx Uptown Organizer and Monique Williams from Families for Safe Streets. Sean and Monique, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having us. For having us. So let's start with Monique. Um, and we're talking about speed cameras in the city and tickets that you can get if you go over the speed limit. Could you tell us before what we want the law to be or what we expect the law to change to be, what has the law been with respect to speed cameras within the um, boroughs of New York City? So with respect to the speed cameras, it has helped to reduce traffic violence. It has helped to um, deter deaths and accidents that happen um, with speeding. 
So with the law that has been um, signed into um, reauthorized, it, it brings uh, more reduction into speeding. It helps to allow, allow pedestrians and bicyclists to share the road with uh, automobiles. Well, sure, let me ask you a question. So in, in Albany, I think there was a time limit as to when the speed cameras would operate. If I remember correctly, something about, you know, maybe 10 a.m. to 6, or I don't know exactly what the time limit was, but yeah, um, Sean, can you tell me what the law was? Yeah, so, I mean, it would surprise people because you think of speed cameras being on a street. I think everyone thought that they were just always on, but in fact, they were only on from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m., and then they were off on weekends and many federal holidays. And we, the research shows that during these times, during the evening hours, during the weekends, um, is when uh, about 60% of traffic violence occurs. Um, so, so it's a pretty significant shift that we're going into now where we're moving in with this new law 24-7, um, you know, year round so 365. But Sean, what was the reason? Why wouldn't we have cameras that just operate 24-7, seven days a week? Why are we not having that? Why, why wasn't that the law? I don't understand. Yeah, I'm, you would probably know better than I, um, but we don't understand either. It was something that um, was very surprising to many. And um, even, even as we were going to Albany and we were lobbying and we were talking to elected officials, many of them didn't even understand why it wasn't law yet. Um, so it was a very much a common sense thing. I mean, because you look at the toll booths, right? It's not like you're only allowed to go through a toll booth over a bridge between certain hours. You can, it's a 24 hour um, highway. You go whenever you want to leave to New Jersey, wherever you want to go to, you go through the toll booth, it takes a picture of your, uh, of your um, easy pass and we're done. It's hard to imagine that the city or the state shuts off your, your shuts off the cameras during particular times especially at night when the roads are, are not as, as busy and there'd be more access to speeding vehicles. Am I correct? Exactly right. And I mean, Monique can speak better to it than I can, but we see where there is um, speed cameras enforce, enforcement that there's a reduction of 55% of traffic-related violence. And you're right, overnight and weekends is when we see the most speeding and when we, of course, see the most um, traffic violence occurring. So, Monique, let me ask you, wh where are these cameras? And, and my second question is, where do we want them? How's that? So most of the cameras were placed in school zones. So to protect, prevent um, ve vehicular accidents or crashes with children. So we saw a high rate of that. Um, since 2018. So that's where they were placed at now. But right now they are being placed basically all throughout the boroughs, not just in front of school zones, and which will also help to reduce speeding throughout the city, not just in school zones. And wh where's the pushback from? Wh who's giving you pushback on the other side, maybe letting you think that it's not such a great idea to have them all throughout different places? Or does it affect, you know, the, does it affect, you know, traffic in terms of does it clog up neighborhoods where are you hearing opposition um we're not hearing opposition for the school speed zone cameras we're not hearing that um most people are pushing forward with that they want to see that they want to see that the speed cameras help to reduce it sean who controls the decisions in terms of whether or not we have speed cameras throughout the city is it is it Albany? Is it New York City? Is it both? Something else? Yeah, right now it's um, because of home rule. It's basically a state level um, decision. And that's why we created, uh, we just came out of, of this session. We had a eight uh, bill um, package called CVRSA, Crash Victims Rights and Safety Act. Um, and so this was one of those uh, that was part of that statewide um, push. And we have a statewide coalition called the New York State Safe Streets Coalition that has over 100 participating organizations and members. And so, you know, it, it's not only a city issue. This is a statewide issue for sure. And we see the reduction in this traffic violence happening statewide when there is speed cameras. I would say some pushback that we have seen 
are really based on myths and misunderstandings. Um, a lot of the myths that, especially in the Bronx, that this is an equity question as well, that the speed camera enforcement is somehow, um, you know, uh, tracking people or monitoring people, which is false, right? The cameras are only taking pictures of license plates that are, are going over that speed limit. Um, there's no like profiling or anything that happens, um, any racial profiling, any, any, any class uh, discrimination. It's speeding, it's speeding is a, uh, is a crime. So, I mean, if you're That's speeding, right. it's, it's, it's a crime. Why shouldn't we be able to tell who you are if you're speeding? If you don't speed, you don't have a problem. And if you do speed, you could hurt somebody seriously, Correct. possibly kill them. So I, I don't understand why people would have a problem with it. But then again, you know, that's just my opinion. What's next for, for, for you and for Monique? What, what are you looking for to push through next? Well, so out of the packages that the, the package that we had with the eight bills, three of them passed through the Senate and the Assembly. Um, and the speed camera one got signed off on by the governor. There's a few others. There's two others that were uh, pending to get signed off. And we're hopeful that the governor will sign off on them. Um, but really, at the end of the day, we understand that the speed cameras are just part of the solution and really safer infrastructure um, and having control over speed limits on a city level are going to be what really takes us to the next phase of creating safer streets. Monique, I don't know if you had anything to add. I was about to ask Monique, what are your so, thoughts? So Sammy's law is what, what's next for us. Um, this didn't get passed this year. So we're looking to um, go out and meet with our friends and advocates um, in the state to help push this bill pass to reduce the speed limit from 25 to 20 because it saves lives. All right. Well, I want to thank both of you for coming on today. You do some terrific work, um, Sean and Monique. And hopefully you come back in the next couple of months. Let us know how you're, uh, how you're faring with additional legislation. <laughs> well, Appreciate you. it, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Right. Well, stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more coming up right after this. that's all we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and of course you, the viewers, for watching. If you have a topic you'd like to see on a future edition of today's verdict, feel free to email me at davidlesh at bronxnet.org. Till the next time, know your issues, Richard Verdict. See you in two weeks.